everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Macy. I head up the go-to-market teams at SafeBase. Super excited to be here with Jerry. Thanks a lot, Macy. Uh, Jerry Perillo. I was a chief information security officer for about 20 years of Intercontinental Exchange, which owns New York Stock Exchange. So all that say, I'm a, I'm a cyber nerd. And um, I've been practicing it for so long that I kind of came up with this whole methodology. And now I work with smaller companies to implement a lot of the same things I figured out. Cool. So at SafeBase, we don't yet have a CISO. So Jerry, that's what we're talking about today. I'm curious, how do we know when it's time to hire one? Well, you're going to make me hit the punchline way too early here, and I thought 10 minutes would uh, not be very long. Um, but no, let's get into it. So why do anybody care about security? And I'm kind of projecting on you why I think you're sitting here in the, in the process of this, right? So you can see up on these slides, I put together three things. One, I call it altruistic security. I could also call it organic. It just means you're actually worried about a breach. Maybe a few of you feel that way. All of you probably would say you feel that way. Uh, then you got regulatory requirements. You know that already if you're subject to those. But I think the most common reason is, is that third one. And TPRM is also known as all those damn questionnaires you're getting in your email every day with 300 questions you got to answer. So that's the real reason I think people figure out security and want to get it in place overnight. That's a lot to have to solve. Do you really think a CISO can solve all those problems for you? Well, it's a challenge. I'll definitely uh, admit that. So um, what are some of the challenges to that? One is that CISOs are really expensive. Um, in financial services, it's not uncommon uh, to see you know, um, seven-figure salaries now. Um, certainly in big tech as well, just so you can pay your rent around here. Um, but in, in any event, it's really expensive. So even if you can get away with finding one for $300,000, you got to kind of think, you know, how good are they? So that's one of the first challenges, right? And then the other thing is timing. I mean, with any employee, I think it takes about 18 months for them to get their legs and really understand enough of the business. And that's even more true of anybody in cybersecurity, where if you don't understand what's going on and what the product is, then you're just wasting time there. All right, so they're expensive. And it seems like all hope could be lost. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> so I, right, I want to offer some hope here. So. I guess the real trick, the real punchline here is that when should you hire one? Yesterday. And it might be a little bit too late, but that's not going to do you a lot of good. And I wouldn't come up here just to tell you that. Uh, the good news, though, is that there's a whole lot of things that you can do as a non-cybersecurity executive to get started. And I see a lot of companies that are just kind of waiting. And as I just mentioned, even when they finally get someone in the seat, then the clock starts again. And meanwhile, they're not able to close business, right? You're getting in those questionnaires. It's holding up deals left and right. So what I think a lot of people are really looking for is how do I get started today? And that's what I'm going to talk about. So I have this little... Um, mnemonic, if you will, called Trick that I've been using for a little bit. I just put it together mainly so I'd remember to always talk about the same five things when I'm talking to clients. Um, but you see it up here. And what this really works for is, I mean, for one, it's for a governance committee. So I, I just say, get all of the non-cyber people you have. So if there's only two of you in a startup, then you know there's two people in the committee. Uh, but normally, you're talking about a founder, whether it's uh, you call yourself a president or CEO, general counsel, CFO, business people. I work with a healthcare startup, the chief medical officer is in their cyber gov now. You gotta start like that and don't think that you need to be a cyber expert to be involved in security. On the contrary, you have to be a business person to do a good job of it. And then once you get together, what do you talk about? Well, this trick thing gives you five, uh, five slides to have in your whole board deck, or your, sorry, your whole committee deck. And I'm gonna talk about each one of those things with a really rapid fire in six minutes, um, what they actually mean and what could be in them. So the first one here, this visualization, it's bespoke, so it's pretty unique here. But the idea is really about how do you even talk about threats to begin with? You have to set the mission. You have to figure out what are we really worried about? Because if you don't, you're just boiling the ocean. And you see it in those questionnaires, right? You get a question with uh, an Excel spreadsheet with 300 questions. And if you answer 290 of them right, you get a pretty good score. Well, what if those 10 things that you answered poorly were everything that that client should really be caring about? So they should be doing this, but you can certainly start out by doing it yourself just to figure out what the mission is. So you see here that there's a number of icons in this heat map, and each of them are meant to be a, encompassing a, one of six threats that are endeavoring to encompass all cybersecurity. So in there you see sabotage, you see extortion, you see financial fraud, and a few others. They're organized by motive, by objectives. 
you, if you've touched cybersecurity at all, you get just clobbered with this vernacular of what about insider threat? What about malware? What about ransomware? It never ends. But if you just organize them by the objective, it really helps. So imagine you're sitting in there without a cyber person saying, okay, sabotage. Is that us? Are we worried about it? Are we putting out a movie about North Korea and Kim Jong-un next month like Sony did? Maybe not. Okay, maybe no one's really trying to sabotage on us. Maybe we're, we can put that off a little bit. Extortion. Does anybody care about ransoming us and getting a bunch of money and holding everything hostage? Quick answer is yes. Even if they don't realize you don't have any money, they'll, they'll do it anyway. Uh, but the minute that you have something to lose or you're really worried about uptime, then yeah. I mean, everybody's getting ransomware these days. So that's like kind of a layup there. And then fraud. I mean, how much do you have in accounts? Do you do payments? Do you do transactions in your platforms? So you get the idea here. You just take a finite university's threats, and you know better than any cybersecurity person what that would be like and what a day would look like. Where you do bring in some cyber expertise, and you could do it by just bringing in a consultant. You could bring someone for free. You could bring someone who works in cybersecurity in another company just to talk about what does it look like. Hey, we're a little worried about extortion. What would it look like? Oh, well, they might send you a phishing email, and then you'd click this and that. It's good to get some expertise when you're talking about that. Uh, on this visualization, this depiction, in the dark icons, you see the idea of an inherent risk, and that's should we be worried about it? The things above that dotted line are the mission, and they're the things that you're worried about. You codify that, you drop it into a strategy document, and you just answered about 20 of those questions in the Excel spreadsheet. Do you have a cybersecurity mission? Do you have a vision? What's your strategy? All that comes right out of this. And what you're saying in there is we really are worried about this, and so should you, and we're not as worried about this. We don't hold data, so we're not a data theft risk, or vice versa. The lighter icons are the residual risk, and that's saying after we took a look at how we're doing, we're really worried about where we're landing and we have a lot of wood to chop. Or we, after doing a lot of testing, we've actually found that we're pretty good, so we're, we're all right in that. How about the R? Um, so risk. Risk is all about just having a risk register that's tool agnostic. If you buy a security tool, it's going to come with a whole list of what's high, what's medium, what's low. If you're going to buy another tool, it's going to be a whole other list with a different scoring criteria. What you need to do is start out before you buy any tools, have a common set of fields. They're all in here. I know you can't read them all here, but you, some of them are obvious. What's the likelihood of this manifesting? What's the impact? If you start out and establish one of these early on, it could be in Jira. It could be in Sheets. It doesn't matter. You don't have to pay for a tool that early. Then when you start buying tools, bringing tools, leaving tools, open a bug bounty program, have an engineer just raise their hand and say, hey, I'm kind of worried about this. No matter what it is, you know where to put it into this register. The I, another table, another sheet. It's incidents. Similarly, you want a bunch of standardized fields. And this is just so anything that happens, you're assessing with the same vocabulary. So when one day you're getting bought, and as part of due diligence, they ask of any incidents in the last six months, you can answer with a consistent, harmonized vocabulary. Yes, we did have this many incidents that you should care about, and here's our definition. And again, you create a procedural doc for that, and you've got another answer to a lot of inquiries. Then the two Cs. So the controls, and this won't, you won't have anything day one, but once you identify some risks and start doing something about it, then this is your, your classic, how's the project going? Red, amber, green. And then compliance. And this is what you probably are being spoon fed all day, every day now about security is how do I get my SOC 2 report? And yeah, you're going to need one of those sooner or later. If you do everything that I just mentioned, then when you walk through that process, it's going to be so much more commonsensical because you'll have a background behind it. So what are you doing in the, in the governance meeting about compliance? Well, now you're talking about, OK, we think we're ready in November to start the SOC 2 process. We've engaged these people. They're going to kick off. And here's what they're going to do about it. Awesome. That was a lot of information. Super useful, but a lot. Can you kind of share your key takeaways for us? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, first of all, start early is on here. I bet anybody who even came to this conference, it's you're already getting hit with these inbound inquiries. I mean, of course, that means if you're B2B, but it, you know, maybe B2C, you get a little more lead time. Um, so this is a little late for me to even say this, but I think starting early before you're under the gun, before you're just trying to get a deal over the finish line, but rather when you have a chance to sit down and talk about the mission and that sort of thing, definitely. Secondly, as I started out saying, don't wait until you have a CISO and don't wait until you hire or outsource or anything else because you're going to have those same problems with getting them up to speed. Start with the experts you have, including yourself, that understand the business and walk through and memorialize that thinking about what's going to be most important to us. And then that last bullet point, you know, a lot of people say compliance doesn't equal security. Probably any of your engineers, when you tell them you're going to do a SOC report. <laughs> but what I like to say is that is true, but compliance is a lot easier when you're secure. So after you've gone through this, then when you go through one of those audits, you'll have all the, all the underpinnings. You'll have a lot of the documentation as you just memorialize the thought process that I went through, and you'll be off to the races.